After the success of the Queen's Gambit, the sale of chess sets increased more than a thousand percent, but the popularity of the show was never because of it being about chess. Instead, it explored an archetype that I think we are universally fascinated by, the archetype of the self-destructive artist. Avicii. Jim Morris. Gunnar Joplin. Gifted singer Amy Winehouse. Mac Miller died here just before noon. Nothing to be said, it's all in the music, man. The lead singer of Nirvana, one of the world's most popular rock bands, has been found dead at his home in Seattle. Police said Kurt Cobain had apparently shot himself and a suicide note was found nearby. And the Grammy goes to Amy Winehouse. I think the more people see of me, the more they'll realise that all I'm good for is making tunes. So leave me alone and I'll do it. I will, put, I will do the music. I'm the Lizard King! I can do anything! Kill me. Come on. Kill me. Go on. Come on, give me some death. Creativity and psychosis often go hand in hand. Or for that matter, genius and madness. You think I'm crazy? Now the archetype of the self-destructive artist is the idea that genius and madness go hand in hand, that there is a direct link between creative brilliance and pain and suffering, substance abuse and mental illness. The creators of The Queen's Gambit themselves argued that the show is not so much about chess as it being about the cost of genius. But why then is this a story arc that we are so fascinated by? We don't have to look far both in the real world and in our fictional worlds to find examples of what I'm talking about. Now regarded as one of the most brilliant painters in history, Van Gogh's life was one of loneliness, depression and mental illness, where among other things he cut off his own ear and presented it to a prostitute. His life, as we know, ended sadly in suicide, but his paintings lived on and are now some of the most valuable art pieces in the world. So valuable in fact that they are now playing a part in the future of the economy. And that brings me to the sponsor of this video, Masterworks. Now the stock market is down already 25% this year and inflation is lowering the value of the money left sitting in our bank accounts. A new study has shown that the biggest banks and firms in the world are once again ahead of the curve as they are investing anywhere from 30 to 50% of their assets into alternatives. That is investments outside of the typical stocks and bonds. And of course other advisors are now following suit, seeing these alternatives as a way to protect their clients from high volatility and skyrocketing interest rates. And that is where we come back to Van Gogh and the sponsor of this video Masterworks. Because fine art was specifically named by Goldman Sachs as an alternative of the future. Not only is it less volatile than stocks, the last time inflation was this high, contemporary art appreciated an average of 33% per year. And that is higher than real estate and gold during that same time. It is also why Masterworks is seeing increased demand as the year drags on and inflation rises. Their platform lets you invest in contemporary art but at a fraction of the full price. Because they break the paintings into shares, so you invest in a portion of one while you wait for it to sell. And so far Masterworks has sold 6 paintings for an average return of 29% to their members. Including a sale just last month for a 33.1% return. Now of course we all know that past performance is no guarantee of future results. But if you do want to invest in blue chip fine art without needing hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. Use my link in the description to skip the waitlist and you can join Masterworks's over 500,000 members. Now, beside painters, there are writers like Edgar Allan Poe, self-proclaimed loser Charles Bukowski, and of course, crazy ass Hunter S. Thompson. All great writers, but also dealing with depression, bipolar disorder, alcoholism, and drug addictions. And of course, there are plenty of self-destructive musicians, with at the center the Forever 27 Club, with famous musicians that died at the early age of 27, often either because of suicide or self-destructive behavior like alcohol 
alcohol and drugs. Included are Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain and Amy Winehouse. All were unbelievably creative and great musicians who also battled massive inner demons. And these rock stars, I think, indicate the first and also logical explanation for our fascination with the self-destructive artist. Hitchcock once said it, film is life but with the boring parts removed. How can we not be fascinated by those that seem to live the highest highs and the lowest lows? We love to live vicariously through those that experience the most extremes that life has to offer. It is simply riveting, exciting and as fans we don't have to experience the turmoil that comes with it. We can watch it from a safe distance and vicariously experience what it's like to live life balls to the walls as it were. This was even a lesson that Jordan Belfort got taught by Tommy Chong. Hey, do- when they were cellmates in prison. Tommy gave him writing advice for The Wolf of Wall Street, saying that there are two things about writing great stories that you can never forget. First, it is all about conflict. There's no story without conflict. And secondly, it must be about the most of things, about the extremes of something. The prettiest girl, the richest man, the most rip-roaring drug addiction, the most insane yacht trip. I will not die sober! Get those fucking loads! Both of these elements are of course more than present in the self-destructive genius, the tortured artist. We find conflict in him or herself. It is the conflict between genius and madness, divine creation and self-destruction, and that inner conflict then manifests itself in their outward world as well. Another interesting idea is that we want to see madness and self-destruction in those who are brilliant, because otherwise, why do they deserve to be special and we don't? Rage over the nature and unequal distribution of talent. Rage that genius appears where it appears for no material reason at all. Desiring a thing cannot make you have it. The idea that there's always a big price to be paid for being a genius, being special, makes us feel better about our own lack of it. It was awe-inspiring, but it was like, Oh, well, I guess I'm not, you know, I guess I'm not all that special, but you know, but then as I grew up, I'm like, I'm so glad I don't, I never got that genius brain. And with this, I think it is becoming clear what the dangers of this archetype are. If genius and madness, artistic brilliance and self-destructive behavior are inevitably linked together, then for those that are aspiring creatives, artists and entrepreneurs, we might start to think that we cannot have one without the other. It creates a precedent where we romanticize our own suffering. We can start to believe that great work only comes from suffering and pain. We can start to condone and accept our own self-destructive behaviors as a necessary part of the creative process. And at its most extreme, we can even start to believe that an early death is an essential or at least a worthwhile price to pay for greatness. I'd rather die drunk, broke at 34 and have people at a dinner table talk about me than live to be rich and sober at 90 and nobody remember who I was. Many now famous painters only rose to fame and became appreciated after their death. Their troubled lives now part of the mythology around them. The same goes for many musicians. As Jim Morrison once wrote in a poem, death makes angels of all of us and gives us wings where we had shoulders, smooth as raven claws. Dying at a young age creates a mythology around the artist and his or her work. When an artist dies at the peak of his creative abilities, there will never be a slow decline, a fading from the spotlight, a losing of the X Factor and some lesser later works. Tested all the limits, fame, fucking, money. What you gonna do when the music's over, man? When you're too fat and old to go out on stage, what you gonna do for act three? Puke on heaven's door. All that remains is their greatest work and the question of what else could they have created, if only. The paradoxical reality then seems that the best way for an artist to achieve immortality, to cement their legacy, is to die young. Of course this and all the other romanticism that we can find around the archetype of the self-destructive genius, the tortured artist, the beautifully broken, is a lie. 
Several studies have researched if there is a link between mental illness and creativity and no links were ever found and the few studies that did find a link were heavily criticized and eventually debunked. Look, there are certainly brilliant creative works that were inspired by pain and suffering, by the creative chaos in the artist's head. The best songs, paintings, movies or books evoke strong emotions, so it is logical that the artist have strong emotions and experiences that they put into this work. As Kurt Cobain once said, thank you for the tragedy, I need it for my art. And maybe some otherwise destructive behaviors like alcohol and drug use can be mind expanding and spark creative inspiration. But there is one fundamental distinction, the distinction between creative inspiration and creative execution. All the tropes of the self-destructive genius, the tortured artist, are completely opposed to the execution of one's craft. Many of the writers, painters, musicians we mentioned before did not do any significant work when they were in the worst of their depressions or substance abuse, because depression does not suit getting up and grinding it out on the canvas or behind the typewriter. Kurt Cobain did not create any hit songs when he was on drugs. The self destructive artist is not busy creating, he is busy self-destructing. So especially for young aspiring creatives, it is important to not fall into this trap of romanticizing the self-destructive artist, because it will only inhibit our creative endeavors instead of improving them. To romanticize the self-destructive artist is to become arrogant and self-indulgent. It can become an escape from actually doing the work. It becomes a weird combination of self-pity and self-importance. If we struggle with our mental health or depression, we now believe this makes us special and creative. Any bad habits and vices we should be cutting out are now suddenly necessary for our creative input. We might even believe that we have to live a certain wild lifestyle that we can use for our work. But in reality, these are just excuses to engage in our vices and not do the actual work. As Stephen Pressfield argues in his book The War of Art, these are agents of resistance that prevent us from turning pro. Look, creative work is often deeply personal, we put our heart and souls into our creations. There's also something unquantifiable about it, something magical, an aspect of divine inspiration, the muse that comes to us. But we cannot get lost in this magical aspect, because when we start to over identify with our creations, it becomes too personal and this invites struggle and self-destruction. If there's anything scarier than being an aspiring artist, it is being a successful artist. It is a lot of pressure making your next book, painting, album or movie as great as your breakout work, while the whole world watches. However, as Pressfield writes, we must not take criticisms to heart, we must not over identify with our work and we must adopt a blue collar work ethic to our creative endeavors. Creative inspiration might be divine, but it is nothing without execution. And in order to do this, it is much better to adopt a professional attitude, a 9 to 5 working stiff mentality and a clean lifestyle. We also must do everything we can to improve our mental health and seek help if necessary. Because even with creative work, we often have to sit down and grind it out, put in the hours, focus and work on our craft. Ultimately, the romantic myth of the self-destructive artist is just that, a myth.